Thank you for tuning in to Hope TV, the television broadcast ministry of Hope Alive Freedom Church. We are real people offering real hope in the real world. Jesus is Lord. That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all, it's His. And we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is gonna be good. Welcome to our church. Welcome to Hope Alive, good morning. Say good morning. Thank you. How are y'all doing today? Are you excited to be in the house of God today? All right. If you're excited, can you stand up to your feet? Come on. We're going to get our worship on, all right? Can you extend your hands to heaven with me right now? We're going to welcome the presence of God. Lord, we thank you, Father, that you are good. Father, we welcome you into this place, Father God. Lord, we give you our worship. We give you, God, our praise, God. We give you our whole self, our body, our mind this morning, Father. And we ask you to come, God, and envelop this atmosphere with your presence, God. Capture us, God, in your presence today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, shout it out. Amen. Come on, shout it out. Amen. Yeah. 
if you have your Bible with you this morning, would you open them up to Isaiah, the 58th chapter, Isaiah 58. I want to talk to you this morning about true religion. Now, we're going to do a sort of roll call. How many of you guys remember when you were in school, uh, the teacher, before a class started, always began with what? A roll call. So uh, the aim today is to do a sort of Holy Ghost roll call. And, uh, and here's the deal. If you say you want more of God, then let's allow today God to check us. And so Isaiah 58 has this prescription for revival. And I want us to allow the Holy Spirit today to check our heart. Over the next eight weeks, we are going item by item, line upon line, precept upon precept throughout Isaiah 58, and we are committing ourselves for personal revival in a personal fast, the kind of fast that God has called us to do. If you have your Bible, Isaiah 58, I'm going to read verse 1 and verse 2. And then verse 5, this is the NIV translation. God speaking to Isaiah says, Isaiah verse 1, shout it aloud, do not hold back, raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem Eager. I want you to say that with me. They seem eager. Come on, one more time. Say that one more time. They to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right. As if they were a nation that does it what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions. And here we go again. I want you to say it with me. They seem eager. Eager. Say it again. They and they seem eager for God to come near to them. Verse 5. Is this the kind of fast I've chosen? Only a day for a man to humble himself? Is, is it not only for is it only for the bowing of one's head like a reed? Or for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is this what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to do that only what you can do. Lord God, I never asked to be professional clergy. I never asked to be celebrated of men that they would hear my voice. All I've ever asked, God, is that you use me, that your voice would be heard. And so today, once more, as I choose to hide myself behind Calvary's tree today, I ask you, Father, don't let people see me or hear me, but Lord God, that Jesus would be seen that his voice would be heard. God, that your voice would be heard. S speak with great clarity and distinction into the deep recesses of people's personal heart, their personal life. Grant them the answer, Lord God, that they hear this message from you as it be from heaven itself. In Jesus' name, and all God's people agree with that, said amen.
Christ, you see God tell Isaiah, these people seem eager. I mean, they look like they want something. And then God sort of calls them out. He's saying this. You know, is this fasting? Is, is this the measure of your hunger? That one day, one day that you bow your head and you, you cry and you wear a little sackcloth, you, you rub ashes all over your feet that people could see that maybe you're asking God to do something. I mean, for one day, listen to me, if you're desperate for something, if you're hungry for something, you're willing to put out more than one day. And so many of God's people, so many of God's children, and we're all God's children, declare and make statements, God, I want to see you. God, I want to know you. But yet, their idea or their concept about living in passionate revival with God is just a, it's a day, it's a ceremony, and it's nothing more. It's just something that other people might see you and take pity on you. Oh, look, no, he really loves God. And God says, is, is this really, you know, the way that you're going to find me? If this, is this really how you're seeking me? I mean, the truth is, you seem eager But if I were to translate that, God said, if you want to see revival, listen to me, brother, you need to stop faking it with all your religious pretense. All this religious pretense, religious pretense meaning all your rituals and ceremonial formalities. I want you to, I want to declare something today. I want you to know something today. You see, once God's presence and or God's anointing is removed, all that's left is religious pretense. That's all that's left. And you know what I'm talking about today. Many of you have been in the presence of God. You know what it's like to to, to walk into this manifested glory of God. And yet to walk out. And for some, it's been years. God, where are you? You sound like like the people of Israel that were crying out with the same question, God, where are you? But there's a thin line that's drawn that exposes the depth and the sincerity of our heart, the depth of our faith, the sincerity of our heart. You seem eager. God says, no, listen to me. When God's removed from from a place or a, a, a person's life, all that's left is this pretense. All that's left or, or, or is nothing more than ceremonies and formalities. And this is what God said, verse 3, 2 and 3. You seem eager, but you don't really mean it. You're just pretending. I want to talk to you this morning about true religion. The people in Isaiah are crying out to God and they're saying, God, why can't I see you? Where are you? And then God answers and he says, hey, look, uh, if you want to see me, don't, don't, be, don't, don't keep faking it like that. Now, nobody likes a fake. As a matter of fact, probably the number one reason cited by an unbeliever for not going to church would be the church is filled with too many hypocrites. Mahatma Gandhi, the great le- one of the great leaders of India, who was a Hindu, is quoted saying, you know, the only thing that prevented me from becoming a Christian were Christians. It wasn't the gospel that was written. It wasn't Jesus. It wasn't what I read. But it was the contradiction of people's lives who, uh, who professed, to, professed themselves as Christians, but they didn't live. There was no power in their life. They didn't live what I read. These people seem eager. God says simply this in Isaiah 58. He said, look, look, if you want to draw close to me, the kind of fast that's going to draw you closer to me, listen to me, you need to stop faking it with religiosity, all this religious pretense. Let me tell you something today. True religion is not about a certain style or or practice of, of a certain professed faith. True religion is not about a certain exercise or formality of practice. True religion is not a mere custom or ritual or spiritual drill that you and I must run through at least once a week. 
Well, at least those are the good Christians, you see. Others believe was twice a year, Easter and Christmas. And sometimes Mother's Day, because mom asked me to go to church. You know, we call them three-day-a-year Christians. Don't shout me down. As a matter of fact, there's all kind of categories. There's the once a year Christian, three days a year, you know, three Sundays a year Christian. There's the, there's the, you know, two months a year Christian. There's a half the year Christian. Oh, don't shout me down, I'm preaching good. You know, true religion is not about the spiritual drill. It's not even about a family tradition of, of a certain belief or a belief that manifests itself and, and sort of a, uh, and, and it stops at a family tradition. You know, many are Christians in name only. And this isn't, and it, this isn't new, this isn't news breaking headline news. This has been happening even in the day of, of Paul. As a matter of fact, Paul wrote to the Roman church and he said this in Romans chapter 9, verse 6. The apostle Paul said, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. So just because you were born in a Christian family or you were born in America that's known to have a Christian culture doesn't make you a Christian. Just because you go to church on Sunday morning doesn't make you any more a Christian than being, you know, walking to a garage makes you a car. You know what I'm talking about? That doesn't change anything. There, there's, there's something deeper. There's something of greater substance than the superficiality of this religious pretense and this, this formality of going through the motions. You know, there are new polls uh, just this past week that showed that, uh, that showed e evangelicals are more supportive of Rick Santorum's stand on social and moral issues that revolve around uh, the family and birth control and abortion than Catholics. My, my oldest son and I, last night, we were discussing this. He said, Pastor, he said, Papa, did you know that, you know, I said, hey, I, of course. He said, I don't understand it. I mean, Rick Santorum's a Catholic, and he's a devout Catholic. I mean, you would think that the, you know, Catholics would rally around him. And I'm, listen, this is not a plug for Rick Santorum. I'm, uh, uh, are you guys with me? I'm talking about this issue. And I said, Nick, what, what, you know, he said, well, what's the deal? I said, Nick, it, it doesn't take me by surprise because the bottom line is, you know, just because somebody's name is written on a church membership log doesn't make them, oh, don't shout me down, a Christian. And how many people were born into a certain denomination? And just because they're a, a Christian, I mean, uh, you know, th there are many wonderful, my friends that are Catholic. I mean, my background is Roman Catholic. That These are devout people. They love God. And, of course, this is their expression of faith lived out through their de denomination. And, and they're real and they're sincere. But yet there are so many as well that they just call themselves Catholics. But are they really? You know what I mean? Oh, don't shout me down, and I'm, I'm really just being honest. And, and the same holds true in every denomination, in every walk of life. You see, here's the deal. The bottom line is, uh, you know, there are so many that are just Christians in name only. And this is, this, is, this, is what, this is what God is getting at here. And I want you to know something today. None of us, whether we were born in America, whether you were born in a, you know, a, a family that went to church every Sunday, the bottom line is none of us were born Christians. Nobody was born a Christian. As a matter of fact, we were all born sinners. It's not until we were born again that we became Christians. Oh, come on, somebody give God the glory right now. a fact it's just truth now here's what we're trying well, here's what, what we're trying to communicate today what we're trying to communicate today is simply this true religion is not about our family tradition or even our na uh, you know our national culture our, uh, it, that's not what it is and look true religion is much more than a name brand that you that you spend two hundred dollars for a pair of jeans on don't shout me down all the young people know what I'm talking about Now, I want to talk, let me give you today three steps that will eradicate 
religious pretense from your life, thus allowing you to draw one step closer into the presence of God, into that revival that you so desperately seek. James chapter 1, verse 27 James writes and he says this, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless. This is the real deal. This is true stuff. Is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by this world. Let me give you three steps that will draw you one step closer into the revival that you're seeking this morning. Number one, three steps that will eradicate religious pretense. Number one, God says simply this in Isaiah 58, and this is your project. Number one, stop the lip service. Just stop the lip service. If you read James, the first and the second chapter, basically the theme of James chapter one and chapter chapter two James is simply saying, your faith is about your walk and it's not just about your talk. Stop giving me the lip service. Just, can, can you just shut it down for a moment? Jesus said it like this in Matthew chapter 15, verse 8. These people, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts, man, they're far from me. I don't get it. You know, you know what God's saying? You know what Jesus is saying right here? I'm disgusted by this. And you say, well, pastor, that's strong language. You want me to give you strong language? Let me keep reading James chapter 2, verse 20. James said, you foolish man, you idiot. Jeez. You know, if there's a religious devil right now, he's squirming in his seat. Listen to what he said. You foolish, you talk about strong language. You foolish man. You want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Verse 21, Abraham, Abraham was considered righteous for what he did when he offered up Isaac on the altar. Verse 22, listen, his faith, James said, talking about Abraham, his faith and actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did, not by what he said, not by what he said he was wanting to do or what he was hoping to do or what he would like to do or maybe someday if I have time to do by what he did. Faith is made complete by what we do. Now, our faith begins with a public confession of faith. And for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. You can't say that you're a Christian, but you're embarrassed to mention his name in public places. I mean, you you with me? But just in the same way that so many people go, oh, God bless you, brother. God bless you, brother. And that's as far as their faith goes? No, 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 no. Listen to me. If that's you today, I love you. Uh Uh-oh. I'm getting a little wound up, man. Pull, Pull it back. If that's you, you just need to repent, get set free in the name of Jesus because that's just the beginning of your faith. Your faith is made complete by what you do, not by what you said. You know, if all I did was tell my wife, but baby, I love you. I love you, baby. But yet, you know, I'm I'm messing around and I'm in seven different adulterous affairs. Oh, glory to God. And I don't come home at night. I keep the paycheck to myself. I don't buy her any flowers, but baby, oh, baby, I love you. And then I beat her. I verbally abuse her. I mean, faith, it, my, my, my faith is not, or even my, my love language ain't connected. I'll tell you that right now. Verse 26, James said, as, as the body is dead, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without good deeds, without corresponding action is dead. I love the message translation. The message translation translates it like this. The very moment you separate body and spirit, you end up a corpse. Separate faith and works, and, and you'll get the same thing, a corpse. 
and you're saying, Lord, I'm dead. My heart is cold. It's numb. Hey, listen to me today. I come with the promise of God. I believe if you, and, and listen to me, it's not people who are in life, they're on fire for Jesus and you get around them and all they want to do is talk about God. Th this message ain't for them. They're already in revival. They don't need, they don't need the personal Isaiah 58 project for fasting and to get closer. That's not for them. This is for folk who are personally saying, oh, God, where are you? Hope Alive Freedom Church presents Hope Fusion, The Genesis, a must-have collection of covered worship songs of various artists, including Ready for Revival, Get ready for the night, get ready for revival, Rain Down, Mighty Breath, Let God arise. And many more. Let God arise. He reigns now and forever. The Genesis is on sale now at Hope Alive Freedom Church in the coffee shop and hopealive.com. Don't miss out. Get your copy today. to eradicate this religious pretense from your life, number one, what does it begin with? Stop the lip service. Number two, and start caring. Start caring. James chapter one, verse 27. Religion that our God and Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. Listen to me, you want revival? Do you want revival in your life? then how about we start with something as simple as being neighborly? Nothing religious about it, just being neighborly. You know, Jesus told a story. Uh, 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 the story was of the Good Samaritan. And the Good Samaritan, uh, the, the, or the Samaritans were a people that were sort of, uh, uh, they were considered half-breeds by, uh, by Israel at that time. I mean, they, you know, it's almost like they didn't deserve to have a foot, a, a chair at the table. I mean, they, they had to sit on the floor and, and, and eat the scraps that would fall off the table. They, they were considered second-class half-breeds, so to speak. And, 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 and Jesus was approached by a religious spirit, by a Pharisee, who was trying to challenge him. And he said, uh, Lord, I want to get to heaven. What do I got to do? What's the greatest commandment? I mean, what, what's the one thing I got to do? And Jesus said, well, listen, you got to love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, with all of your mind, all of your strength. And then Jesus goes on. He says this, and you must love your neighbor as yourself. Here comes that religious spirit. What? Who's my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? You see, look how quick. Devil's always trying to get out. Get out of the deal. Well, who's my neighbor? Can, can I just go to church? Can I just pray and appear to be, you know, can I just get a, a, a I love Jesus tattoo on my arm? Can I just wear a Christian witness t-shirt? I mean, can, you know what I mean? I buy true religion jeans. I mean, what, what more do you need me to do? I got my Holy Ghost jeans on tonight, today. Jesus said, you know, Jesus told the parable. He said there was a man that was hurt. He was wounded. He was bleeding. He was dying on the side of the road. And one of the priests walked by this man. And when he walked by him, he, he didn't even look at him. He turned his head like so many of us do every night when we watch the news. We see hurting people. And we just, really, it's like there's only so much of that stuff that we can digest without it imploding. You know what I'm talking about? And so we have, we have to shut that part of our emotion off. And, and Jesus said, this religious man, the priest, walked by. Walked by this guy that was hurting and did nothing. Then there was a Levite. I'd like to equate the Levite to the, the good deacon in the church, you know. 
maybe one of the church leaders, one of the regular attenders. He walks by, sees the man in his distress, does nothing, nothing to help the man out. But then there was a Samaritan that when he walked by, saw that man, went, ministered to his wounds, dressed his wounds, picked him up, put him on his, on his transportation, gave him, he rode shotgun on the man's donkey, brought him to an inn, paid for that man's stay there, and then gave the man an open tab, told the innkeeper, listen to me, whatever it takes to get him well, I got the tab covered. Now listen, this man would probably never see this, this, this guy again in his life. The Samaritan would never see this guy again. But Jesus said, this was the guy who was a neighbor. If you would like to be a partner with Hope Alive Freedom Church by tithing or sowing a special contribution, visit our website at www.hopealive.com and click on online giving or simply mail to 2723 West Pinhook Road, Lafayette, Louisiana, 70508. Thank you for your generous heart and much appreciated help in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ that transforms lives. Let's rejoin the congregation and Pastor Bobby as he continues his message. Well, you know, my neighbor had gotten out of his vehicle and, he, you know, he told me thanks for mowing his grass just about four weeks ago. And, and of course, I said, okay, I did. And what did I break? And, uh, and then he told me, you know, he said, no, you didn't break anything. I just want to tell you. Things. Then he went on to tell me that he was in the hospital for the last three weeks. He had had an aneurysm, a brain aneurysm, and he had to be airlifted uh, to New Orleans and uh, where he was at Oshner's Hospital, and there they uh, were able to contain the bleeding. And I, I didn't even notice that he was gone. I just noticed that the grass was long. And, and he told me that he, the Sunday, that afternoon, they had just gotten back from the hospital that morning. And uh, then he went on to tell me, he said, you know, I probably, the doctor told me that uh, I, I'm not supposed to do anything. I probably won't be able to cut the grass for the next four weeks, to which I just looked at my neighbor and said, hey, I got that. I cut it two more times, and I told my wife, we need to go buy a, a riding mower. <laughs> <laughs> so I am in the market. I am looking for it. I know we had one somewhere around this church. I'm just trying to locate it. But, you know, two weeks ago when I was looking at Isaiah, and I looked at this passage of scripture, and I was putting this message together. True religion is this, that you tend to the orphans and to the widows or the elderly who are in distress. God just tugged on my heart. And I said, Bobby, is it enough? You seem eager. You seem like you, you oh, you want me to draw near because you, you cut the old man's grass for even a month but why don't you just take over it for the rest of his life so long as he's your neighbor? Now, it's one thing to cut grass for a month. How many guys know to cut your neighbor's grass for the rest of his life is another thing? Anybody picking up what I'm putting down right here? And in my heart, I just had to respond and say, Lord, I'm willing. So I'm going to cut that man's grass until he tells me, you're not allowed on my property anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, you're done. He, when I start seeing no trespass signs, then I'll know, stay off neighbor's grass. Just stay away kind of thing. Listen to me. If you want, for me, this is about a personal revival. And I believe with all of my heart that if we look at Isaiah 58 and you look at these simple things, like what is true religion? And if you make it a part of your life, simple, week by week, and over the next eight weeks, we're going to look at eight different specific things that God points out in Isaiah 58. And if week by week we tackle, you know, the week's mission, like this week's mission would simply be for you personally. This ain't about a cell group ministry or an eye care group gig. This is personal. That you would make the decision that this week, I'm going to do something. I'm going to volunteer my time, and I'm going to help the elderly, or I'm going to help the orphan, somebody that doesn't have a dad. I believe that if you do that, over the next eight weeks, you find yourself where you want to be, which is right smack dab in the middle of God's perfect will. 
in the middle of God's perfect will. Number three, if you want to break, if you want to eradicate religious pretense, number one, it begins with stopping the lip service and starting what? Start caring. And number three, care with a purified motive. Purify your motive. You see, good deeds that are absent of genuine faith and true compassion that's motivated by the love of Christ are nothing more than filthy rags. As a matter of fact, Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6 said this, All of us have become like one who is unclean. All of our righteousness act, our righteous acts are like filthy rags. You see, people can do good works, good deeds all over. They can volunteer for community projects all over. But if it's absent from a pure motive, that's a pure motive which is driven or originates from genuine faith and a genuine compassion uh, for people, then listen to me, it's like filthy rags. Again, strong language. Now, Jesus drew the distinction between those that were uh, sort of doing these good deeds to be seen by men. And then he gave direction versus those that their hearts were pure. And, and God spoke a, a message to them too. This is Jesus. He said this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. Jesus said, and when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in synagogues and on the corners of streets that they may be seen by men. And if you're a member of this church, you know my dream for this church. You know my dream for this church family. But the kind of visitation that we have from God is not inspired by the gift or the talent that would ever stand on this platform, but rather by the hunger and the purified faith from God's people that are seated on the floor right where you're at today. This is what I long for. You know, can I just be honest with you? Because if it happens in you, on a personal level where you're at, then guess what? The man of God, the talent that's here, the gifted, guess what? They get no opportunity to share any of God's glory. Any. And you know, you know how church has been? Honestly, my perception. As soon as God will begin to move somewhere, it always goes bad. The pastors start, start getting celebrated. Or, you know, if it's great worship leaders, the worship leaders, the, the music team, or the youth pastors, or the children's program. And, you know, the leaders tend to, you know, and I remember this. Let me share this with you. Long time ago, I got saved. And when I, when I was sitting in a congregation who talked about the miracles that they had saw God, uh, uh, that they saw God move and do, uh, you know, generations earlier, 15, 20 years ago, earlier, you know, how they were talking about how things used to be. And I watched this congregation. I was a part of the, that church family. And, but every time a man of God would come to church, you, you know, they were like, let this man will be the key. If he just lays hands on me, if he'll just pray for God to heal me, and if he'll touch me, I'll be healed. Or if I'd get set free, if he'd lay hands on me, then I would get set free. You know, oh, that I might get touched, that I can, you know, may, maybe I'll get slain in the Holy Spirit or something like that. And I remember sitting in the pew thinking, Lord, one day, I just want to be in the middle of your presence and I want to be a part of a church. I don't want to share none of that glory because you already said that your glory, you're not going to share with any man. And I'm believing today with all of my heart that that revival, that move of God is going to take place. But it takes place not here, not up here. It takes place in you as you respond to the word of God. It, and it's responding with something so simple today. Hey, stop faking it. This is true religion. My challenge, God's challenge to you today is that you embrace this word, that you make a decision this week. 
I'm going to visit an elderly person and I'm going to do, I'm going to do a good deed. I'm going to visit an orphan. It don't have to be every day or just one time. Just one time. Just one week. Can we just start there? You know, Jesus said that if you're doing these good deeds to be recognized of men, you've already got your reward. But to those who have a pure heart and their hearts, their motives are pure when they're doing that good deed, Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 5. Look with me in verse 60. And I'm closing. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Years ago, I had a church, I had a leader in our church that approached me, uh, you know, and said, Pastor, just want you to know, I am tithing. I am, I am tithing. I am giving. I'm just not putting my name on uh, the envelope, or I'm not writing a check because Jesus said, don't do this to be seen. And I had to bring just some encouragement and some clarification to the Word of God. Listen to me. You know, if you're tithing and you're putting your name in big numbers, in big numbers, and you, you put your name in big all caps, all uppercase, if you do that so that people would recognize that you're a giver, you already have your reward. But if that's not your intent, let me tell you what I told this leader. I said, listen to me, because I hear the purity of your heart. It's important as a testimony to all your friends and all your family that you would do this in public so that they might see your good deeds, that they would glorify your Father in heaven that's the distinction. So this week, your challenge is to live true religion and do so with a pure heart. Why is that? Because here's the promise of revival and I close. Matthew chapter 5 verse 8, Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart for they, they shall see God. They shall see God. You shall see God. Psalms chapter 24, verse 3 and 4. Who may ascend the holy hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Amen. Amen. How many you guys appreciate that word this morning? The voice of the Father inviting you to walk on the wall. If you would like to be a partner with Hope Alive Freedom Church by tithing or sowing a special contribution, visit our website at www.hopealive.com and click on Online Giving or simply mail to 2723 West Pinhook Road, Lafayette, Louisiana, 70508. Pastor Bobby would love to have the opportunity to pray for you and your family. Our service times are Sunday morning at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock a.m. If you would like more information about the ministries of Hope Alive Freedom Church or to get a copy of today's message, call us at 337-267-7880 or check out our website at www.hopealive.com. And again, thank you for tuning in to Hope TV.